Hello, New Media Law class, and welcome to the uh, last lecture in this module for the semester. And in this lecture, we're going to come back around to a concept that we introduced at the very beginning of the semester, which is the question of new media convergence. And as I said at the beginning of the semester, uh, I use this idea of convergence as really the frame for this class because I think um, it is really the kind of significant, most significant concept for new media law that we're, that we're facing today. And we're going to look at this issue in this lecture through the lens of the cable television set-top box. So by way of a little bit of background, recall the Aereo case that we looked at uh, in the very first class in this module. And that, if you remember, is a case that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and if you remember in that case, Aereo was using uh, sort of little arrays of uh, small antennas that were taking digital broadcast television signals off of the air. Uh, and Aereo was allowing people to get access to that through a uh, web interface. Uh, and if you recall, we talked about other cases that involved uh, cloud-based DVRs by cable companies. And so we have a number of disputes relating to the cloud or to the internet in getting access to uh, broadcast television. And if you remember in the Aereo case, the, the issue at stake was really whether Aereo was in fact performing as that term is used in the transmit clause of the Copyright Act of 1976. And we looked at some of the background of the Copyright Act of 1976 and saw that the statute, um, the Copyright Act was changed in significant part to deal with the new phenomenon at that time of cable television and created a compulsory licensing regime uh, that covered cable television uh, retransmission of broadcast signals. And so in the Aereo case before the Supreme Court, the court decided that Aereo was in fact performing uh, as the statute set forth. The issue in the Aereo case before the Supreme Court was not whether Aereo itself was a cable television operator entitled to the statutory license. It was simply whether Aereo was in fact performing. Uh, we'll see in a moment that there is now litigation over um, entities that are doing things similar to what Aereo did about whether they in fact can qualify for the cable television exemption. So we have some of that background uh, and we talked in that context about this issue of convergence. So when we talk about the set-top box, what are we talking about? And here is the uh, a picture of one of the familiar devices. Uh, I have Cablevision Optimum uh, at home in, in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, and this is the kind of box that I have. Um, and all of you who have cable will recognize something like this. So what is this device? Why do we need um, this device? You know, why can't you just plug the cable right into your television? Um, and really the reason you need it is because the cable providers like you know, Cablevision Optimum uh, encode their signals in such a way that only certain equipment that is configured in a certain way can decode the signal. Now, you know, there may have been kind of technological reasons for this. There were technological reasons for this in the early days of cable television. You didn't have, um, you know, digital televisions. Uh, you didn't have a way of getting the cable signal into the television uh, and having you know hundreds of channels and so on without having a box that was able to do that. Um, my first cable television of my home when I was a uh, child you know we had television with a dial that you had to turn you didn't have a remote I mean it was that sort of television. Today's televisions you know technologically certainly can can handle um, simply being being plugged in and being used in this way, but the cable box is a decoder. Um, and this allows the cable provider to um, have a, a large degree of control over the nature of that box, what that box can do. Uh, and in fact, for most of us who are cable television customers, our cable provider leases us the box. So part of your cable bill 
is a lease fee that you're that you're paying for that box and the cable providers make billions of dollars leasing boxes um, now you can buy a box uh, and um, use a card that enables it to be configured for your cable provider but that takes a little bit of ex expertise it's a little bit buggy um, it's much easier for most people um, even people with some degree of technological savvy to simply lease the box from the cable provider so the cable provider gets the lease fees for the box but the cable provider also can significantly control the architecture of the box um, and what does that mean well you know you, you know from using cable television in, in, in your home um, you know you have your cable remote you can go to the cable providers um, channel guide and select a channel uh, you may have an app on your iPad or your other personal device uh, but again it's going to be your cable providers app and that's going to structure um, the kind of choice of channels uh, that you have or the way the channels are displayed to you um, there aren't not uh, unless the cable provider sets it up this way there are not separate apps for separate um, providers like a CNN or something like that um, and there is not a truly convenient universal search function I mean you can search in the Optima map for programming you want to watch and it's going to bring up things within that app but it's all constrained within the way that uh, the cable provider decides they want to set it up um, and that is kind of the heart of the legal issues that we're dealing with um, as we'll see, there have been uh, there have been kind of pushes on a number of fronts to um, a, in the language used by the FCC to unlock the box, to um, allow uh, kind of the disaggregation of uh, cable television service from a a particular box that the cable company can kind of control, to make it easier for you to subscribe to cable, but to perhaps have a web-enabled interface or other app kinds of interfaces that allow you in a way that you as the user might find more convenient or desirable um, to search and to find the programming that you want. That's really the heart of this debate. Why does this debate matter commercially? Um, one of the reasons it potentially matters commercially, as which we'll talk about, is the question of who's controlling your access to the information and then perhaps even more importantly who's controlling the data that is reflected in the choices you make in terms of what to watch or what not what not to watch so there are some big commercial issues at stake as well as some consumer choice uh, issues potentially at stake so the first case that I, I want to highlight that I gave you to read is this uh, film television versus film on You'll see that this is a uh, trial court decision in the District of District Columbia. Uh, this case is currently up on appeal um, in the D.C. Circuit, uh, and we don't don't have an opinion on the appeal yet, so it'll be interesting to see what the D.C. Circuit uh, does with it. You see from the facts of the case that Filmon has an antenna-based um, web-enabled system very similar to Aereo's, and the court notes that the system is very similar to Aereo's. But what Filmon does is, is to say, well, we are going to apply uh, and say we are a cable television system under Section 111 of the Copyright Act, and we want the compulsory license. We want to be treated like a cable television system. So what the court has to do is to look at, specifically at Section 111, and decide, well, is Filmon, does Filmon really meet the definition of a uh, cable television system. So we see here the language in section 111 that allows the compulsory license and we see here the definition of a cable system in section 111 F3. So you know some things to note that are going to be key in this case about this definition is this word facility, a facility, and this word located. Located in any state territory trust territory or possession of the United States. Now, in 1976, when this statute is, is adopted, um, this definition is probably relatively straightforward. 
um, you know, you had sort of these large facilities with, um, with you know, big powerful antennas um, that are taking signals over the air and that are, you know, then kind of uh, redistributing them or big satellite arrays or other things of that nature. So kind of readily identifiable uh, facilities, spaces that are taking in the, in the signal and then redistributing it, distributing it. Now, of course, that already significantly began to change as, as cable and satellite technology developed. But now with this, uh, a technology like Filmons, you've got you know, very small um, antennas, you know, the size of a, a dime or a quarter um, that are on arrays of chips um, and that are just on a server somewhere. And then you have the data being distributed in packets across the internet. And recall all the way back to internet law, the very first class of internet law, and we talked about packet switching and the way traffic goes over the internet. So you've moved from the 1970s kind of cable system with large discrete facilities that are taking in signals and redistributing them to the highly distributed internet-based kind of system. So the question is, is this highly distributed internet-based kind of system uh, does it meet that definition of a cable system under the statute? Now, one of the really interesting aspects of this is the language in the Aereo case, the Supreme Court Aereo case, that said Aereo system was in fact analogous to a cable television system. Um, but remember that the Supreme Court did not make a holding about whether Aereo's system was a cable television system. That wasn't the issue in the Aereo case. Aereo wasn't claiming to be a cable television system. The claim Aereo was making was you know, we're, we're not performing. We don't have to be regulated in this way. We're not violating copyright. We're not performing. Um, and, but the language in the, in the decision seemed to suggest that they are functioning like a cable television system, which would argue for uh, Filmon being treated like a cable television system and being able then to qualify for the compulsory license. But here, Judge Collier, says, well, but that analogy in the Aereo Supreme Court case is really only in the context of this question of whether Aereo performed. It wasn't looking specifically at whether Aereo or, or uh, an entity similar to Aereo, a setup similar to Aereo's, would qualify under the definition to be a uh, cable television system warranting the compulsory license. And here, Judge Collier says, we have to look carefully at this language of facility and location and we think of what the internet is. The internet is not a facility nor is it a location. The internet is um, highly dispersed. It is servers and switches and computers and wires all around the world, not any one facility uh, nor any one location. Now, Judge Collier does acknowledge that the physical layer through which the internet can, delivers video includes cables and wires and microwaves and all those sorts of things. Um, but she's suggesting that the physical layer is so highly dispersed that it can't be considered any one facility. A very interesting opinion, I think, again, going all the way back to um, the first few classes in our internet law class the very beginning of the semester, that first module, or if you took it last year, um, you know, that question of what the internet is, is it a uh, specific place or a thing, is it defined by its physical layer, does it, does it sort of exceed its physical layer, um, and Judge Collier seems to be taking an approach of saying, well, the physical layer is just this one part of it and we, we can't define it in any particular way or localize it, and even though you know, Filmon's antenna arrays are going to be in one place um, or, or one set of places. I mean, they could be distributed, but they're going to be discrete. Even though that's the case, it can't fit this definition. And really, I think, you know, part of what Judge Collier is doing is not entirely evident in the opinion, but if you think about ways of doing statutory interpretation, um, one approach that 
judges sometimes use is to look at the surrounding history of when the statute was produced, uh, when statute was drafted. And so the, uh, the surrounding history of the 76 Copyright Act and Section 111 um, is a very different kind of physical system than, than the Internet. So an interesting opinion. I don't know how it'll fare on appeal, um, uh, and it's going to be litigated, I think, um, in other places throughout throughout the country. Um, but again, it's a, a way in which our m contemporary concepts of, of what media is and how media is delivered is really crashing up against the existing legal and regulatory framework. So the next case that I asked you to read is this Kaufman versus Time Warner case, a, a Second Circuit uh, decision from 2016. Um, and this case is an antitrust case that's alleging a tying arrangement between premium cable service and set-top boxes. So we've looked a little bit at antitrust law this semester already. Um, and you know we, we've uh, looked at different kinds of possible antitrust claims from agreements that restrict trade. Um, and then there are other kinds of antitrust claims that arise from monopolization. So it is not an antitrust violation simply to have a dominant market position. You could acquire a dominant mar market position through just through good competition. But if you have a dominant market position, then there are certain practices that if you engage in them could be antitrust violations under uh, Section 2 of the Sherman Act. And one of those kinds of violations is called a tying arrangement. Uh, and the idea of a tying arrangement is that uh, there are at least two separate markets. Um, and the defendant has market power, um, it, market power in the antitrust con context uh, means a, a dominant position that is either a monopoly or akin to a, mon a monopoly that allows the uh, supplier to price consistently significantly above what a what a competitive market price would be. So uh, a party has market power in, in one market and that market power allows them to compel consumers to purchase some product or service in a related market. Um, so you know let's say that uh, you have a dominant position in the production of coal uh, and you know people uh, power plants need to burn coal to produce uh, energy and they need to use an industrial burner to burn the coal so you have market power in coal and you say if you want to buy my coal you have to buy my burner if you don't buy my burner I'm not going to sell you coal or I'm going to sell you coal at a significantly higher price you're tying the two things together, right? That's the idea of a tying arrangement. So the, uh, the claim in this case is that uh, there's a market for premium cable service, so basic cable and then premium cable, where additional channels, uh, movie channels, other things like that. A market for premium cable service, and then there's a market for set-top boxes. And because the cable companies, in this case Time Warner, um, condition the uh, sale of their premium cable service to be a coded channel that can only be used with certain set-top boxes uh, and in fact most people as we've mentioned lease or rent their set-top box from the cable provider that this is a tying arrangement uh, and that the court should find this to be uh, a violation of antitrust law uh, and should require Time Warner to make its cable service available in a way that doesn't necessitate consumers using a particular set-top box. Now, you know, there are, at the outset, if, if you're not familiar with antitrust law and um, tying allegations, there's, there's a, a kind of a meta problem with this claim, which is that in the past, um, the courts really looked unfavorably on tying arrangements of all sorts and were very likely to find tying arrangements of all sorts to be uh, anti-competitive and to violate antitrust law. But that jurisprudence has significantly changed. 
uh, and, and courts are much more willing now to really closely scrutinize an alleged tying arrangement to see whether it really has a negative effect on competition or not. So at the outset, a tying claim is, is going to be difficult to make out. Um, and here, the, the majority in the Second Circuit, for two reasons, says the tying claim fails. The first reason is the, the majority says there is no evidence of demand for set-top boxes apart from premium cable service. Uh, and this goes to how do we decide when there are separate product markets. Uh, so often there are, there are related products and you might say, well, you know, how closely related are, there, are they? Um, are they so closely related that they're really just one market with multiple components? Or are they different enough that I can say there actually are separate markets? And, you know, a, a basic way you do that is to assess consumer demand and to see if there really is demand for the one product apart from the other. And here, the Second Circuit uh, says, on a motion, for the plea, uh, a motion to dismiss on the pleadings, says there is no evidence that anybody wants set-top boxes apart from how they're used in conjunction with cable services, premium cable services. Further, the court says, again, on a motion to dismiss, Time, War Time Warner doesn't have market power in the relevant premium cable service market. Um, and again, this has to do with how you define what the relevant market is. Uh, defining it in terms of a product, defining it in terms of geographic scope. Um, certainly, it's true that there are competitors to Time Warner, you know, nationwide for premium cable service. The question is whether there's a local market definition and what that might be. But in any event, this, the court says there's no evidence Time Warner has market power. So for those two reasons, the tying claim, the antitrust claim uh, at this level fails. Now, there is a dissent from Judge Droney, and Judge Droney says, well, first of all, this is a motion to dismiss on the pleadings, so we should really construe the pleadings liberally. Um, and, you know, secondly, there is evidence of consumer demand for alternatives to the set-top box. Uh, and there is evidence that the cable companies, Time Warner and the other cable companies, are stifling innovation so that that consumer demand is not being met. And one of the key ways, one of the key pieces of evidence for Judge Droney is the fact that the FCC has tried to, uh, through regulatory means, to unlock the box. The FCC has recognized that this is an issue and has tried to take steps to do it. Those steps uh, so far have not been successful, and we're going to talk about those steps in just a moment, some of those steps in just a moment. Now, the majority in uh, Kaufman had said, well, you know, the, the fact that the FCC is trying to take some steps and hasn't really gotten much done shows that it's really not that big of an issue. If it was a really big issue, the FCC would have gotten something done, consumers would really care about it, the public would really care about it. Uh, Judge Droney says, well, the fact that they haven't been able to get it done is because there are such powerful interests at play. So again, a very interesting decision uh, showing, as we have also seen in the past, I mean, we've seen both of these streams that I've just brought up here. Um, copyright law, specifically in relation to the cable television compulsory license, and antitrust law. Um, and both of these streams of law trying to deal with these issues of convergence, and so far, you know, claims really not succeeding in changing kind of the entrenched way the industry operates. And that brings us to the current regulatory debate. So, you know, one way that this could change, I mean, Congress could change it statutorily, or perhaps the FCC, which regulates um, uh, cable companies, could change it through regulation. So the FCC, for the past uh, year or so, has been uh, touting a an effort to unlock the box. Uh, and, you know, kind of the long and short of it is that the FCC wants to require cable companies to use open standards uh, rather than having sort of a proprietary encoding of their stream, but to use open standards so that 
all cable streams from any cable company could be decoded on any box that's using the same open standard. Um, and what would be the effect of that? Of course, the effect of that would be that the cable company would uh, lose its control over what which box you can use in order to use that cable company. Now, um, these proposals uh, so far have uh, not succeeded in even getting a vote uh, through the FCC. They've been put forward, they've been debated, they've been hotly debated. Um, and just this fall, the FCC delayed the vote on these proposals. Um, of course, now that the uh, presidential election is over, we don't really have any idea um, what is going to happen with the FCC and with these proposals. One of the things I wanted you to know, and it was in uh, the Wired Magazine article on this that I gave you to read, is the extent to which this potentially is a fight between new media, aka Google, and old media, aka the cable companies. Um, and remember that I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture that there are questions about how you access the information you want to watch, right? Is it just set up through apps? Is it just set up through search? You can see how Google would have an interest in uh, unlocking and dispersing all of this so that you could just go to Google and do a search for what you want to watch on your TV. And then also, maybe uh, certainly just as important and more important, um, who has control over the data that you're giving when you're doing that search? Presently, if I use my um, Optimum app on my phone, or if I'm just surfing using my remote, you know, uh, Cablevision has that data. If the box is unlocked, then Google, either through the web or through uh, Android enabled devices or however, um, potentially could have access to that information, which is obviously extremely valuable to them or some other third party manufacturer. Another question is. Um, could services be created and devices be created that serve other content along with your search? So, you know, if I search for Bundesliga soccer um, on the Optimum app, I'll get a list from the Optimum program guide of uh, programs that use the word Bundesliga and soccer. Um, if I do that in Google, I'll, I may get those things as well, but I'm, I may also get a whole bunch of other things maybe relating to Bundesliga, maybe relating to soccer, maybe just relating to Germany, maybe relating to uh, other sports, right? All sorts of other things, which is how the Google algorithm works. And I may also get ads or ad sponsored links that are served up as well. Um, so do we want to enable those kinds of things as potential platforms? Um, is that something, you know, an entity like Google would, would primarily control? Um, or leave it in the kind of context it is now. That's what a lot of that fight is about. Um, so I think this is also one of those places where these questions of new versus old media and convergence uh, are bumping up copyright, bumping up against antitrust, bumping up against uh, regulatory and statutory questions. So this is the end of this lecture, and we will uh, talk more about all of this when we meet for our last in-person class on Thursday.